keep going a little back and forth with this. We started with arbitrary vector spaces. Actually, we started with matrices. Then we went to abstractions thereof by considering arbitrary vector spaces. Then we introduced the notion of coordinates and showed that after all, all these objects can all be mapped. If they're finite dimensional, they can all be sort of seen as similar. There's this structure preserving one to one correspondence through this assignment of coordinates. And then we said, okay, let's investigate the matrices a little closely. And now again, we'll go back and forth. So it's like there and back again, like Bilbo Baggins. Okay, so what do we do now? We say that, well, look, since this matrix is really nothing special, in just the n-tuple, when you're looking at vector spaces as n-tuples, then it is this matrix that captures a certain type of operation on objects in n-tuples. So can we not think of something similar that carries out something, some similar sort of operation on arbitrary vector spaces? In other words, now we want to abstract or get a more abstract notion of what a matrix does to n-tuples, yeah? And we want to cook up something more generic of which probably the matrix will be a special case. So two of the key properties of matrices that we have seen are that they are linear in some sense. What is that sense? We say that you take this Fn and you take V1 and V2 from Fn. And if you hit it with a matrix, say A, which belongs to Fm cross N, if you hit V1 plus V2, then you can actually write this as AV1 plus AV2. Yeah, apart from that, there's also this other property that if you have A acting on some C times V1, then it is written as so in this manner, right? So basically, this matrix is taking objects in N tuples and mapping it to objects in M tuple. Note that we have very frivolously used this notation plus here, but what's actually happening is this addition is happening over N tuples. Of course, they look similar, so we don't even worry much, but this addition is happening over N tuples and this addition is happening over M tuples. But what this allows us to do is to say that it doesn't matter whether you first add those two fellows as n tuples and then operate the matrix on it to get an object in Fm, or whether you act on them individually, convert each of them to m tuples, and then use the notion of addition as defined in the set of m tuples. Yeah. So this addition, notion of addition, carries over. Now, when you're looking at n tuples and m tuples, you say, oh, okay, that's just a padding. I mean, the idea of additions are very similar. You just take n, you just take m, what's the big deal? But when you're talking about arbitrary vector spaces where you don't have fn and fm, but rather v and w, and objects that map from v to w, then the notion of addition, vector addition in this vector space v, and that of addition in vector space w may be quite different, is it not? Of course, they have to be over the same field, but they, the additions may be defined in different manners. But if you can cook up something that inherits this property or that carries forward this property of a matrix, then it seems like doesn't matter what the idea of addition in V is and what it is in W, it doesn't matter how you act on them, whether you first add them in the parent vector space in the domain V and then hit them with this A or whether you first act on them individually and convert them to objects in the codomain. So what I'm saying is, if now this is my V and this is my W, and suppose I have a mapping phi, which takes objects in V and maps them to objects herein. So suppose this is V1, and this is V2, so this is say W1, and say this is W2, all right? What I'm saying now is that if you now want to cook up a new variable, which is V1 plus V2, 
suppose this is v hat is equal to v1 plus v2. This maps to some object here w hat, okay. The claim is that this w hat has to be nothing but w1 plus w2, yeah. You see what is going on. If there is an there is a, a mapping that sort of preserves the nice property of a matrix of what a matrix does on n tuples and m tuples and then this is what we would expect it to do. I mean if you just take the sum of these two fellows in V itself according to the rules of vector addition in V, you will get V hat then you act on it using this mapping phi and you will get some W hat here. So this phi maps V hat to W hat. On the other hand if your friend decides no I am going to just hit V, V1 with phi. So I am going to map V1 to W1 here first and V2 to W2 here first and I like the addition operation in W. So after having obtained W1 and W2 here I am going to add them according to the rules of vector addition in W. Your friend will also end up with the same object. You will end up with W hat as a map of this V hat your friend will obtain W hat as a sum of W1 and W2 in W. See the difference? Yeah, this is very important to observe. Otherwise, these things do not often appear like very different. But when you look at different vector spaces, so this phi is a mapping from V to W. Okay? And, okay, just before I make that point about phi, and erase this, let us also point this out. Here this mul multiplication is happening in Fn, but here this object is already in Fm. So this multiplication is happening in Fm. Exactly the same thing holds for multiplication as well. So now I can get rid of this matrix and let us take the general what we call a linear transformation, okay. So, okay, let me raise this. Suppose V and W are vector spaces over F, okay. Then this phi, then phi, which is a mapping from V to W, is said to be a linear transformation if one phi acting on v1 plus v2 is the same as phi acting on v1 plus phi acting on v2. Once again this addition is according to rules of W, this addition is according to rules of V. Maybe I should use a colored chalk. So this addition is happening in V, this addition is happening in W, right? And secondly, phi acting on C times V is equal to C the scalar multiplication thereof of C with phi V. Once again, this is scalar multiplication happening in V, this is scalar multiplication happening in W. Of course, where are these V1, V2 and V coming from? So this is for all V1, V2 coming from V and this is for all V coming from V and C coming from the field. So you need the same field of course because if they are not defined over the same field because this is a scalar multiplication over W, scalar multiplication over V, if they do not, if they are not defined over the same field then it does not even make sense, yeah. So if these two properties are true of any mapping from V to W, then we say that such a mapping is a linear transformation. That is the definition. 
right. Furthermore, if W is equal to V, then we say phi is a linear operator or an endomorphism. Okay, so when it maps from V to itself, if it is a linear mapping from V to itself, it is a linear operator or an endomorphism that is just a name you can often encounter such alternate names in different contexts. So just do not get scared through that term endomorphism all that is being said is it is a linear mapping from V to itself okay. So let us see a few examples of course the first example is the trivial case of matrices because of course f to the n f to the m these are all vector spaces. So let V be equal to f to the n W be equal to f to the m then A of size m cross n over the field f is definitely a linear transformation has to be because that is what inspired us to go ahead and define this. We have already seen that these properties are true of matrices right okay. So let us take some examples. So suppose, suppose now we have v is equal to f to the n, w is equal to f to the m and phi of x sorry phi of x is given by a okay, so phi phi is basically let us say phi which is a mapping from v to w maps what maps x to a x for a belonging to let us say small x yeah a belonging to f m cross n that is a first example. A second example would be let us say v is the space of okay let us say I will just write phi so that will be easier. So phi is a mapping from let us say the space of symmetric matrices real symmetric matrices to real symmetric matrices okay such that you push in a symmetric matrix P of size n cross n and phi gives you A transpose P plus P A for so let us call this phi A sum A which is let us say yeah r n cross n. You can go ahead and check that this is a linear uh, you know it is a linear operator in fact it is an endomorphism you can just go ahead and check yeah this is symmetric right. So you take such, takes a symmetric matrix P and if you look at this then what is the transpose of this A transpose P plus P A it is the same thing so it is a symmetric mapping no problems with that right. Uh, Let us say so suppose we take um, phi as a mapping from what sort of a vector space okay let us say R m cross n so let us say this phi a b R m cross n to R m cross n where it picks up objects here so this is x um, m cross n matrix and maps it to a x b where a is some m cross m matrix and b is some n cross n matrix. So when I am giving you these examples what I expect you to do is to check not just believe me what do you do to check? you take two arbitrary fellows here and in fact would you believe it if I tell you that the check for this is exactly very similar to the check for a subspace yeah because there are two properties you just take C times a vector or alpha times a vector plus the second vector and see that if it gives you 
alpha times the operation plus the other operation which I which is by which I mean that you take two arbitrary objects v1 and v2 from v and then you check if so check if phi alpha v1 plus v2 is indeed equal to alpha times phi v1 plus phi v2 for all for all alpha in the field and v1 v2 in v that's just the check in each of these examples just try out that check if this checks out its linearity you see you put this one 0 and you have checked the scalar multiplication you put this alpha as 1 you have checked the vector addition so it's the same check there you check the closure here you check if this is indeed true yeah so you for example here you pick out some p1 and p2 which are both symmetric matrices and then you take alpha p1 plus p hat as alpha p1 plus p2 and check that if it is indeed turning out to be like so right so if you hit, if you had fed in p hat here let's let, let me just do this as an as an as a check so that you can try out the rest so consider p hat is equal to alpha p1 plus p2 right so what is phi of a on p hat this is a transpose alpha p1 plus p2 plus alpha p1 plus p2 times a yeah because this is what p hat is so this is equal to what because of the way in which you matrices and their multiplications and their products get added you can obviously write this as alpha a transpose p1 plus alpha p1 a just rearranging the terms plus a transpose p2 plus p2 a but then clubbing these terms together what is this this is just phi of a acting on alpha p1 but you can also stick this alpha outside right so you can just pull it outside plus phi of a acting on p2 it's because the rearrangement and all is so simple that this is definitely a linear uh, operator right so you can go ahead and check it for all of these examples that i've given you and convince yourself that indeed and that will also give you some practice on how to check whether something is a linear transformation or a linear operator right so this is an important uh, class of transformations or operations that you can see which is a linear transformation or a you know from arbitrary vector space to arbitrary vector spaces right much later in this course not much later i mean a few lectures we will see that each of these operations that is this phi can be captured through some matrix okay and again the secret ingredient to that would be the assignment of coordinates right so every vector space that you have get a basis for it an ordered basis for it and then every vector in that vector space gets mapped yeah to some n tuple right so then all that it boils down to is some finite dimensional vector space to another finite dimensional vector space means mapping from some n tuple to some m tuple for some values of n and m where n and m just happen to be the dimensions of v and w and it turns out that well matrices are definitely a class of linear operators or linear transformations but matrices are all that there is when you are dealing with finite dimensional vector spaces there is nothing beyond it that is not so obvious but that is what we will see after a bit of basis constructions and seeing how these linear transformations are represented in terms of basis and change of basis we will see that it is in fact just matrices and matrices alone that capture whatever is being done through these linear operations here all right so before we close today's lecture since we have already introduced uh, the idea of linear transformations 
I might as well tell you or, or talk a bit about certain properties of these linear transformations. But these are not necessarily properties of uh, transformations or linear maps defined over vector spaces. Rather, as it turns out, these properties are also true of uh, mappings from one set to another. And you've heard of these properties before, okay? So, to be precise, the properties I have in mind are the following. First, it's known by many names, a one-to-one -one mapping or a monomorphism Sometimes it is also called a monic mapping, very rarely though, and also an injection, yeah, or an injective mapping, yeah. And the other type of mapping that we shall concern ourselves with is onto or an epimorphism. or an epic mapping or a surjection, right? And then you have the type of mappings which satisfy both of these properties, that is they are both injections and surjections. Those are the mappings that are called bijections. Injective and surjective, it means it's bijective. Do you know one of the most handy uses of bijective mappings? I'm not even talking about linear maps, I'm just talking about maps. That are, what is its, what is one of its uses? You can actually show or compare sizes of sets. Yeah, the cardinalities. When I say a map is one to one, so suppose there is a set S1 from which you map to a set S2, just in a very naive set theoretic way. If I'm saying something is a one to one, what is the definition of one to one? I'll define all this more formally, but what is the definition of one to one? Loosely, anyone would care to volunteer? What is, the, how do you define a one-to-one -one mapping? Yes? Every element of S1 should be uh, assigned to, will be having a unique image in S2. So, in other words, if I have this mapping F, yeah, which maps things from here, objects from here to here, I can say this, that F S1 is equal to F S2, if and only if, Yeah, S1 is equal to S2. In general, unless you pick up the same object on this side, it will never lead to the same object here on this side. So this is the condition to check. Now with that in mind, you see, if you have a mapping that, that is defined over this entire set S1, that means every object here gets mapped to a distinct object here. So at least this fellow S2 contains as many objects as the number of objects in S1. Countable, uncountable, I don't care. You see, but that's, the, that's the idea of a mapping, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the reason why it says that if you have a one-to-one -one mapping, it definitely means that the cardinality of S1 is less than or equal to the cardinality of S2. And in that same manner, this uh, surjection turns out to be a dual of that notion. What does it say? Surjection says, on the other hand, so what is the definition of surjection? An onto mapping? All the elements in S2 must be mapped. So every element in S2 must have a pre-image in S1. That means for every element that I pick up here, I should be able to find out some object here. Yeah. What does that tell me? That this fellow, yeah, sorry. So, so what is the cardinality? So for, let me just write that down. So, if 
for any S belonging to S2, there exists S hat in S1 such that f of S hat is equal to S. Yeah, this is the definition of on 2 then f is on 2. So, anything that I pick out from here S2, I should be able to find out a fellow that maps me to that fellow here. What does that tell me in other words? So, I am I'm, I'm picking out arbitrary fellows from here. So, now my base is here. I am picking out an object here, I know there is someone here. I am picking out another object here, I know there is someone here. Yeah. So, if I keep picking out objects here because therefore every fellow I will be able to do it. Let me exhaust every fellow here and what have I ended up with? Is it? Same? But I may not have exhausted every fellow here. Right. For every fellow here I have picked out someone here. Now of course the same fellow cannot map to multiple things. That is a one to many mapping, that is not a, a proper mapping, right. So, it is either one to one or many to one, it cannot be. So, so every fellow here is at least taking out one fellow here, if not more. If it is a many to one, then for every fellow here there might be multiple fellows sitting here. But nonetheless for every fellow after I have exhausted this set entirely, there might still be fellows here, even not, even if not, if, if there was a many to one mapping in any case this set is richer or this set contains more number of points or more objects than this set. So, in this case I would definitely be able to argue that the cardinality of S1 is greater than or equal to the cardinality of S2. So, now it is just a trivial step to see that if you have a bijection and mark mind you I am not even getting into linearity. We will talk about it in the next lecture when we talk about linear transformations and their properties vis a vis. I am just talking about simple mappings, set, mapping from a set to a set. I am not even talking about vector spaces, right. I am just saying that if you have this sort of a thing and if you have a bijection, it means it is a way, it is a convenient way of showing that two sets have exactly the same number of points, is it not? And these mappings need not always be expressed in an analytical fashion. For example, if I take a line segment like so, I probably shown this example somewhere earlier and I take a line segment like so and I take this vanishing point here, all right and I draw lines from here, from here, from here, from here and I, this is a mapping. It does not have to be like x is equal to, y is equal to some fx. So, I am taking a point here, it maps to here. Look at this, that is a 1 to 1 on 2 from basic geometry, right. So, this is a bijection which tells me that no matter how long the line is, there are exactly as many points in this line segment as in this line segment. So, any two finite line segments have exactly the same number of points. There are very funny things. These need not be linear all the time. In fact, that is the same way you can cook up maps and you can show that the number of points in R and C, yeah, you can try looking up some of those interesting conclusions that they actually turn out to have similar cardinalities. Of course, with the caveat, mappings are not linear. But again that is a matter for a different discourse, we will not get there. In the next lecture, we shall look at these two properties in the light of these linear transformations that we have learned and see how we can massage them to have a nice convenient check. So, if someone tells us that a linear transformation is 1 to 1, what are the sort of immediate conclusions that I can draw for a linear transformation and someone tells me it is 1 to, what are the con conclusions I may draw and if someone tells me it is a bijection, why is it the case that I will always be able to invert it? Why should it always be invertible? We will see all of those things in the next lecture. Thank you.